I was in this city in our province, the capital city of Brabant, and I saw their newly completed residential houses under architecture. These are new residential houses, and I thought, but of course, this is personal. What a great poverty. And which chance did we miss? And you see the red arrows I made into the picture. And you see everywhere those very poor uh, railings uh, at, at the windows. And I thought uh, this must, this, this could be done uh, in another way. Uh, and what chance did we uh, miss? Uh, my um, message is that blacksmith should get into contact with city planners or architectures or budget people who are uh, responsible for the design of the buildings and uh, the, 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 the parts of the buildings. So in this way, the ironwork so that you can get the chance to make some work of your craft and uh, make the cities more beautiful. It's the same complex, uh, also of great poverty. And what uh, I thought is, how is this, uh, uh, how is this grown? And you see in, the, in, in 1800, you see, uh, arts and craft work, and then we got the industri industrial revolution, and then you see that uh, people like more uh, fabricated stuff from the factories, etc. And the reaction on this is again the arts and craft movement, which uh, uh, gives an appeal to uh, the honest way of uh, uh, working. And here you see a building of uh, Gaudi. It's in Barcelona. The building is called, uh, one moment, La Pedrera, the, the, the quarry. You see uh, a facet with uh, balconies of modernist building designed by uh, Gaudi. And I thought when it could, uh, at that time, it must be uh, also can be worked out in this time, but maybe the blacksmith should be more proactive to activate the architects and the city planners. In the starting of the uh, 20th century, the Amsterdam School of Expressionism had uh, a big eye for details, and they also decided to put some really beautiful ironwork to the, uh, to the buildings. Here you see uh, an entrance of a, of, of a hotel, and you see that uh, the architect did a lot of work uh, on detailing the ironwork uh, near the entrance, and also above the entrance, the fencing, the, the railings in, in front of the picture, of, of in front of the building. And it's, uh, I think, a mischance that uh, it's now hardly done. Uh, and my appeal is this, like I said, uh, blacksmith can re uh, gain work to contact with architects and city planners to uh, make their craft more known, more well known. This was a warming up for the part of John. And John is now doing his part. Okay. Thank you, Paul. And my focus is on this famous banister, which is at the Museum of the Decorative Arts in Paris, which is adjacent to the Louvre. And it's by Louis Majorelle of Nancy, France. He inherited the furniture factory with his brother and it was a factory approach to the production of furniture. And this was the era of the Art Nouveau style. And the School of Nancy is well known. And it had its own substyle within Art Nouveau. 
Around the turn of the century, the Maljoral brothers added a blacksmith studio to produce hardware and some architectural ironwork for clientele. And throughout the woodwork and the ironwork, there's a frequent use of the Monet du Pape motif, which we see here. You may recognize it. It's also known as the money plant or the honesty plant. My source of information is Gallica, the online archives of the National Library of France. The blacksmith is Jean Capel, maybe 10 years older than Louis Morel, but we have limited information on his life and education. It appears that he's a regional blacksmith. It appears that he's an employee of Majorelle in the early 1900s to produce the banister and other ironwork. But from the literature at Gallica, it shows that he's self-employed at his own Nancy studio by the second decade. So here is the museum with a room dedicated to Louis Majorelle. You can see in the background the railing, the banister, but one can approach it to study it. However, I discovered at the website of the museum photographs of the banister, which we'll see in a moment. And one can zoom in and see details that would not be available to anyone, even being close to the banister, one could not see these details. So this is the website itself, and we'll be returning to the website at the end. We'll focus on these five areas. And it was at this point where I saw the blacksmith, the Fronier, and I have done research on Jean Capel through Gallica. So here we have the close-ups. We can see pitting from the forge. Once we're at the website, we'll see how we see evidence of screws connecting the scroll work, the branch work to the verticals. The base. And one can understand that it's not that complex, that these are separate elements, fullered, coming together. This is unique. It almost appears to be a butt weld. I cannot yet explain its making. And here is the Monet de Pop itself, that motif. It's a bronze casting with gold leaf. I call these the roots. We can see the deep fullering, the texturing. And we'll spend some time at this junction. At the time of this banister, it's 1904. And only at this time are two Frenchmen developing oxing acetylene welding. So it's not likely that Jean Capel would have applied oxygen acetylene welding to this. And I believe that these were three bars continuous, but then forge welded together and worked. Next slide will show, here's the vertical and working with Paul and Patrick, we concluded looking at these photographs that this is likely mechan mechanically joined either through a screw that comes up into a threaded hole or a tenon 
coming down and hot riveted at the base. And a close up yet again. So now we can zoom in. Look at this. So we can see a head of a screw connecting over here. And once again, the junction with the thin line. Again, head of a screw over here. And we go to this one. And we click and we're in. We can see other elements, mechanical junction. This was that close up of likely a, a screw or a tenon. So I'm thinking this is a con one continuous bar, the second continuous bar, and the third continuous bar. And then they're forge welded together and worked until it's ready to receive the vertical. And that concludes my presentation. And any of you can visit this website and do as I'm doing. Oh, it was really great presentation. And uh, oh, is that work, I've seen something very similar to that carried out by, is it Louis Majorelle? in France at that time, that, um, that type of design. And uh, I know I've got a book on his work and I know he was one of the ones that did experiment with gas welding uh, oh. at that early time. So is that, did that blacksmith work for Majorel or are they connected, do you know? It's, this ironwork is from the Majorelle factory, and Majorelle is employing Jean Capel to create this banister. Mm. I should say that uh, in 1903, there's a previous banister in Nancy, identical to this one, but in the converse. Mm. But your knowledge of the oxygen Acetylene welding is, is very good. I did not know that. But uh, have you actually been there and seen the work? No, but that's the gift of this website and the photographs. One can approach this ironwork so closely, more so than being there in person within a foot away. Mm. I should definitely be making a visit to it because I'm a great admirer of that work. It's so beautiful. It is, but I learned that you can't approach this work. You, ca you, ca you can't go to that work at nose length. So you can't see any detail uh, without good pictures like John made. Ah. That's, that's what I learned, but maybe in France they changed their mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have heard it's often such, if you come in the blacksmith closing, they let you behind the scenes and everywhere. Just because uh, you you are one of them, you know, maybe yeah. maybe you you have but, uh, maybe it works. I have posted in the chat a, a website from Argentina where you can see two of the famous uh, Arnobo buildings uh, in Buenos Aires. Is also from the Gaudi design and is very close to um, the outside of many of the buildings in, in Barcelona. So maybe uh, we can find something close to that. Um, I think one of them you can uh, visit inside 
the other one is a house. Um, I was, I also want to ask uh, in the slide uh, 18, is one piece or two? And also uh, the three, the three long bars that looks first world and then uh, could be also maybe, I, I think looks a little like there are two long pieces and in the middle is two short ones for the decoration maybe also. But um, in the photos, it's very tricky to, to see. Yeah. <laughs> in, in slide 18, which I call the root, yeah. is where the railings attached to the building the staircase, it looks from the limited view, it looks like three pieces welded together. Mm. Oh. Yeah, it's a very interesting approach to how to build a, something that big in different, a, in different way because some parts has a screw, some force weld, it's, it's very interesting. And some history, this banister was exhibited in 1904 at a salon in Paris, and then the museum quickly acquired it and installed it at its museum in Paris. So it never had use in a home or an office and went directly to the museum. The 1903 banister in Nancy, identical to this one, has been is painted. I don't know when it was painted. Now, I, I think what you often can forget is uh, when you get in that time period, the way of joining and fixing materials together through forge welding was one of the main ways of connecting. And uh, you had such a, a high skill set you had good quality iron, you had good quality fuel, and the practitioners were so experienced in using those materials that they were able to execute what we look at as pretty difficult things, that they had the practice skill set to, to deliver those things, where we'd have to take a few goes at it, I think. But it's a technique of those welding bars like that I've used myself I've produced um I copied some fi a fired set of fire dogs from the British Museum that were Anglo was it Kel Anglo Roman and uh it was a commission and I decided to do it but it took me a while but that technique of how they did it there's some things that are similar in this particular job I did and uh iron if you get good iron it really does weld it exceptionally well and quite easily compared to mild steel is it is it possible that these three bars are fire welded i would say it is possible that they are fire welded but they probably when you look at it um they might have not have needed to do a lot of forging they would have been a minimal amount of material there to, to do the job. So once it was welded, it mm -hmm. didn't need much drawing out mm -hmm. and working. I would say that's the skill in the craftsman who made those sort of things. But you mm -hmm. would have thought, as it's so well finished, there would be evidence of a scarf or something, wouldn't you? That, that you can't see anything, can you, really? not in the photograph of a, how it was joined. Abana hopes to have a two-page article in the Anvil's Ring on the banister, authored by myself, but we must pay the museum a fee for use of the photographs, mm. also execute an agreement. It's not, it's just 284 euros equivalent to $284 USA, which is reasonable. Hmm. But that's why we have these notations within the presentation, because we must honor the copyright of the museum and its photographer. I was, I was looking back at in the website, uh, looking at these three bars. And when I uh, zoom in on the picture, 
I see some, uh, yeah, how do you call it? Welding, uh, uh, need, yeah, it, it looks like it's fire welded, but of course I'm not sure, but I can see uh, yeah, where the uh, bars are connected uh, and it looks like a weld. So more interesting is also how did they uh, polish it? Well, our oh, yeah. iron comes up very bright, doesn't it? When you uh, when you do polish it, it's got a much more silvery uh, finish than steel. Yes. Raw iron, yes. raw iron, hasn't it? Maybe it was scraped and pickled. I would say definitely pickled, and then variations of sandpaper and grit to bring mm -hmm. out the armor bright finish. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, in this in this one in the top. Looks like it's one piece, but I'm not sure uh, if it's three pieces uh, and well together or the, the connection is missing in the photo. I don't know. I think sometimes some of these older pieces there, they do find quite simple ways of connecting things. You know, it's when you see it, it but they, they're done very, very well. So, you know, they fit together well. When you look at some of the jointing on Tijoux's work in Hampton Court, it's just, it's, it's an obvious solution, but it's just so well executed. And I think that's probably what this is like. It's the level of finish is very, very high, isn't it? It disguises a, a lot of the joints. Sorry, Michael and I were just talking about the, 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 the cleaning up process and, and how much of that is, is a whitesmithing thing, but it doesn't look like it's whitesmithing. It looks like it's polished over the hammer, but some of you guys who know more about the, the processes that were happening in these, in these forges, um, are, we using, are we using loose grit on some sort of a soft cloth or something in order to get that fantastic armor polish, but leaving scale in the, in the pits. I have a photograph, uh, an original photograph of a workshop within Egard Brandt studio. And it shows uh, the polishing of candelabras by ladies and men, very tedious work, but it appears to be emery cloth or sandpaper cloth, but also they're just hand scraping too. Wow. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. But as Steve said, in, in, the, in the British, when I was in Britain, I saw this, um, the British have armor bright, and that's after pickling and phosphoric acid. So all the scale is, comes away. And then one proceeds with the sandpaper or the emery cloth. Um, or other means of bringing the steel up to that pewter-like, or it's really a silver-like finish. Yeah, I think as well when they're, when you're finishing stuff in that sort of level of, you know, you're gonna have well, nice smooth anvils, hammers are gonna be well finished, rounded edges, and the craftsmen, are, you're looking for minimal imperfection so this is after pickling with citric acid and then wire, wire brushed, okay? But it's, it's polished steel, not as, not as bright as the banister. When I started talk, you, you start thinking about the finish with the first hammer blow. <laughs> and I guess that's what these guys were so practiced at. Also, some of the picture looks like there is any oil treatment or something to protect the iron. Looks in some parts. In some parts, looks a uh, very shiny or like a, the metal color and not a, a cover or an oil treatment, for example, to get the protection. But looks that is any rust also there. So it's very interesting. I guess if it's in the museum, it'll be um, in quite, maybe it's in quite, you know, the, the humidity is controlled and 
mm. stuff like that, I would guess. Yeah. Quite possibly. And, and, it, and good raw time doesn't corrode in exactly the same way as mild steel. Also, if you go uh, in this bar to, to the bottom, it uh, looks, you, you can find the shine of the two parts, the, the handle, if you go down, in the left part, you have this chop Corby, and then you have the fuller, yeah, going down. Yeah, there, when the fuller, the square of fuller starts, you can see the connection in the top, yeah, yeah. there. Yeah, in the top is, looks like, yeah, there. Very good, yes. Yes. It's a very interesting construction. It is. Yes, <clears throat> it's an interesting detail. I think it's a, a square bar, which is uh, uh, the, where the railing is laid over. Can you uh, lower it a bit, John? Yes, there. You see the screw, you see here? Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is a square bar uh, and uh, the railing is uh, made in the uh, negative square and it's mm -hmm. laid over like like uh, like this. You understand what yeah. I mean? And then it's a, a hidden <laughs> I think it's a hidden screw. So you don't uh, damage your hand when you go with your hand down to the railing. Very this, interesting, very, yeah. very genius made. This would be an excellent thesis for a master's student in graduate school to explain the entire production of the banister and then ideally recreate elements. Yes. I think also we need to think that probably the, the bars you need to sell first and then all the handle or all the rail comes later probably so could be that probably in the in the bottom there is another screw do you know john if there are any uh uh details of the uh, how how does how the iron is uh, built up? Is it uh, only ferrum and and a bit of coal, or what is it? I no, I do not know. Paul, you said in this introduction that we do, we have so much poverty now in the structural ironwork we see. That's my and, um, my opinion. That's my opinion. Huh? <laughs> well, and I totally yeah, agree, no, and I think yeah. many people here do. But do you have like a like a idea yes, why right, how that thanks, come Bill. and uh, how one could maybe change this um yes like i like i said i think um uh, when blacksmith suffer about uh, do they have enough work or not they could be proactive and go to some architect or some city planner uh, to uh, promote his uh, crafts uh, I'm sure there are architects and uh, city planners who, who like this. For instance, in Amsterdam, where total Amsterdam, total old Amsterdam is uh, filled with ironwork of uh, uh, Joan van der Meij, is a uh, famous architect of the Amsterdam school. And he uh, wanted to, to, to detail his bridges with, with, with ironwork. Uh, I think it's a difficult job to... Uh, play acquisition at architects at uh, and so on, but it's not uh, chanceless. And I know because of my former job that uh, when you have a building budget uh, to, 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 to realize some uh, uh, residential houses, part of the, the part of the budget is for building and part of the bu building budget is for steel work or uh, glass work or uh, natural stone or uh, baked stone. Um, but contractors 
always want to pour out everything. They will uh, buy in so as cheap as possible uh, to get more profit. So the 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 quality uh, is totally out of balance in this building. I I I showed that picture of. So it's not a it's a, it's a no go to go to a contractor, or a Dutch contractor especially, because they won't uh, give uh, an under contractor any room for uh, more and better work, as cheap as possible, and as quick as possible, and um, uh, no time for uh, playing. So the uh, the architect or the, the the buyer of the home of the building has to say okay i want this details in uh, forging work in in craft work and it might be also uh, the, the, the 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 woodwork and and etc i think there are definitely chances um the price is always a, a, a thing but i learned that for good work people are willing to pay but they must see it and they must learn to see it yeah i think you what you say is is very true and in my own experience i've found that uh, private clients are much more likely to invest in your skills than building contractors or there's too much there's yeah. too much play on profit margins for them but private clients say so you can build more of a relationship with them. And if you exactly, and I guess that's what you've got to try, got to try with architects and, and people is to uh, try and educate them and get a relationship, yeah. but it's difficult to do on some of those levels. Yeah. I have found also that the educate, educate the customer is also important because Many times I found that maybe they think it's expensive and yeah, sometimes the work is very expensive, but in their minds is way more expensive than in reality. So many times they try to save money, uh, picking very easy designs, but the, a great project doesn't need to be very expensive and sometimes uh, they go for very easy designs instead of trying something else so i find that you must uh, in some ways show the customer what are the designs how much really costs because maybe they they want to avoid something and i think is in some architect architectural works a uh, or with many architects happen something like this, that they try to save money, but they pick some designs that are very ugly for the final product. And maybe you can make something great for not a crazy amount of money. So I think this is very important. This is a really old issue. There is a great set of articles done in I think the American Architects, whatever organizations um, journal in the 20s and 30s, maybe, by Bernard Heatherly, that was explaining forged ironwork to architects and showing examples of what forged ironwork can be and why it's cooler, and then um, and comparing it to what architects think it is and how badly they draw it and how maybe you should talk to a blacksmith and and the benefits to your work of getting a blacksmith. So this is, you know, as at least a hundred years of trying to get black uh, architects to understand what blacksmiths have to offer. Uh, true, and it's a, a wave movement. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the picture five is uh, the inner side of a, a, a residential apartment in Amsterdam, and you see the nice uh, blacksmithing work uh, in the staircase. This is the entrance of a, a building in Amsterdam, a famous building. And you see that the architect, Joan van der Meij, um, had really uh, made really time for beautiful details in blacksmithing, also in curved uh, bricklaying, etc. Uh, but it is well known. But um, you see that then 
there is a new wave in architecture and uh, it goes to industrial, etc. And uh, I think uh, when now people like more the arts and craft work, there is room for, for blacksmiths and other people to discuss with uh, architects and city planners about this kind of work. Um, maybe you can show the other pictures, John or Beth. This is the main the main uh, window of this building, and you see what they did. That's a, a great job. Yeah, well, actually, it... in this building, you can see how you can repeat the work, saving a lot of time because many Art Nouveau are very unique and very tricky to make. Yeah. This one, you can you can show something that is great, but you save also money because you can like mass produce. Uh, may, maybe the picture of Gaudi is, uh, uh, you can show, uh, this, I think, or this one. This is in Barcelona, and you see what he wanted, the, uh, Gaudi. He, he, he made a total uh, design of the building, and this is his style. But uh, he was, let's say, positive, brutal enough to make these details and Really, I love them, uh, and I think, why uh, can't we do it this now? And I, I'm sure we can uh, with good blacksmithing, and we have good blacksmith in the world. Uh, they can come and they can make this work. But you have one to uh, to design it and to to fabricate it. After all this talk, I would still have a question to you, Paul, because you have this background in with, with some architects, how I understood. And maybe you could give advice for these viewers, and um, I, I would find it also particularly interesting, how to best approach architects, because I think it, it's like, at least how I have this impression, quite different mind of people often, and maybe there, there would be a way like to approach them so that, you know, they could understand each other better. <laughs> <laughs> well, most architects are very open. I, I don't have experience with German architects or Spanish architects, but uh, my experience is that architects are very expressive and open, and they are easily uh, to, uh, to, 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 to visit. Just make a call, explain your thing, make uh, some presentation material, what you can do, and... Uh, just and start explaining what you want. Uh, it will take you a long time, uh, and you will see that the one the one architect is not the other one architect. But you can uh, sure find uh, uh, when you see a building uh, his name, the name of the architect, and then just talk to him. And if anyone wants to um, to get some uh, more advice, you can always ring me. Talking about yeah. architects in Spain, I was uh, talking a few months ago with the blacksmith in Spain uh, in Santiago de Compostela, and he told me that one of the problems he found uh, is that many architects try uh, they try to use uh, modern techniques because um, they have more marketing, so looks like they work better than the old techniques. But um, this blacksmith. He, for example, used the technique to put a lead in the rock to lock the iron. And the modern techniques maybe can steal for 10 years, 20 years, but this one was there for 500 years in the church. And that's the big difference. And there is where you need to teach uh, them that sometimes modern techniques doesn't work that great as the old ones. So his work was more about a show them that the old techniques are still working and you can still use. And there is people that know the techniques. Yeah. That is important. And it is also important to uh, get the get experience with these people because what you see in Holland now is that uh, we need to build 100,000 uh, residential homes a year because the government uh, failed to build enough uh, houses. You only can manage this. Th they won't manage it, but if you want to manage this, you only can manage it when you go to build houses in factories. And then you see 
more and more poverty because factory houses are of good quality because the uh, insulation is dry, the wood is dry, uh, you can uh, uh, fabricate under good mm -hmm. circumstances, but you get uh, uh, not, not unique homes, you get mass production and that's a pity. So, uh, and the architects who do this are uh, some bit of designers, but more uh, industrial processors. They think, how can I easily process this house in 30 days and not in 100 days? Mm -hmm. And uh, then you have the architects and the people who know how to build, uh, who are more affected to the to the craft, uh, like me. Uh, I see what's happening in the modern building world, but I gave myself uh, the task to uh, spare the craft uh, and zoom into oh. ironwork, but also I also look to other craft world work for restorations, etc. That is what you have to keep in eye when you look for an architect or a city planner. Is he has he finger uh, finger finger with uh, what is building and what is craft work. Uh, we, you all know Rem Kolhaas, that's a famous Dutch architect who made very big buildings, uh, especially in the Far East. I think he's a good architect, but he's, he has no feeling with craft work. He can say his thing about it, but he doesn't know what it is. No, I think it's a, hu it's a huge challenge integrating craft craft-based skills into modern architecture. And I think it's up to the practitioners. You've got to bring those, try and bring those craft techniques and skills into a, into a, into a, you've got to translate it into a modern, I suppose, stylistic language that people, that sits today. I mean, I think a lot of people do reproduce past styles too much and uh, whilst they do sit well in some areas I think there needs to be more exploration of using forging processes to produce designs that sit well in the 21st century uh, but I think it's a big challenge and uh, so many people are totally disconnected from craft making processes mm -hmm. nowadays they have no real understanding of how things are made uh, they understand factory assembly and catalog ordering and assembly but not actual creative craft practice so we just got to keep working at it <laughs> yes yes it's like telling them that milk is not is that milk is coming from a cow and not from a bottle that's it <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs>